Can I ask the speakers if you would to identify yourself before you start speaking? We'll start over here on my left. Thank you, Chairman Buttry, Vice Chairman Mulvey. I'm Steve Sharp. I'm the uh, fuels manager for Arkansas Electric Cooperative Corporation. Uh, AECC is a membership-based generation and transmission cooperative. It provides wholesale power to more than 400,000 <coughs> of our uh, customer members and uh, scattered over pretty much the entire state of uh, Arkansas. In order to satisfy this obligation, uh, we've made agreements with uh, other utilities uh, to provide generation and transmission resources. Our largest generation resource uh, that we have uh, purchased on this uh, co-owner type basis uh, are the White Bluff and Independence coal-fired plants there in Arkansas. Each of those plants burns approximately 6 million tons of uh, Powder River coal each year. Uh, AECC has a 35% ownership interest in those two particular plants. Entergy is the majority owner of those plants and also operates plants. Uh, our interest in the paper barrier situation stems primarily from our ownership in the Independence Power Plant in Arkansas. Uh, this plant is located near Newark, Arkansas on a line of the Missouri North Arkansas Railroad Company or uh, as we refer to it as the MNA, which is now sub a subsidiary of Rail America, formerly known as Railtex. Uh, MNA operates on this line by virtue of a pair of agreements dated uh, December 11, 1992, between MNA and Missouri Pacific, which at the time was a subsidiary of Union Pacific, or UP. UP had acquired the Missouri Pacific in 1982. These agreements provide for the lease and purchase of track in Missouri, Arkansas, and Kansas. The MNA can physically interchange traffic not only with UP, uh, but they could physically interchange traffic with Burlington Northern Santa Fe at several locations, Fort Scott, Kansas, Lamar, Carthage, and Springfield, and Aurora, Missouri and also they could physically interchange with the Kansas City Southern Railroad. Uh, <clears throat> however, uh, just because they can physically interchange with these railroads uh, doesn't mean that they are able to do so. The agreements that uh, exist between the MNA and the UP contain what we've been calling paper barriers that preclude the MNA from participating in and prevent AECC, Entergy, and other co-owners of the Independence Plant from enjoying competitive <coughs> rail service to that plant. Uh, AECC certainly welcomes the board review of this issue, and we support the uh, Western Coal Traffic League, League's efforts related to paper barriers. Uh, we have experienced the adverse consequences of, of paper barriers, and we believe that it's important for the board to give careful consideration to the need for limitations on or the elimination of uh, this practice of paper barriers. We believe that the paper barrier issue is uh, integrally related to the loss of transportation options that we've experienced at the Independence Plant. And I guess this is uh, one of the, maybe we're kind of in a somewhat unique situation because uh, these agreements uh, are in the public domain in this case, so uh, unlike a lot of these situations which, uh, which are not, uh, we, we are able to talk about some of the details. Um, first of all, the, uh, these paper barriers effectively prevent the MNA from delivering uh, any, PRB, <coughs> any PRB coal that's originated by the Burlington Northern Santa Fe. 
We found this to be uh, especially important to us during time periods when the Union Pacific has had service problems and has not been able to deliver to us the amount of coal that uh, we have under contract with them for delivery. Since the time of the m and lease, there have been three different episodes uh, where Union Pacific has been unable to make the timely deliveries to the Independence plant that we need. And in each of those three situations, we had to put burn restrictions on the plant. And uh, the cost, cost to AECC has been tremendous. And in fact, we're still uh, we're still in the throes of the third episode. We're still not out of out of the uh, woods on this last episode. We're still having difficulty getting the coal that we need to the Independence plant. Uh, in the past, uh, had this same line segment still been uh, uh, owned by the Mur Mur <coughs> Missouri Pacific, excuse me. Uh, they would have been able and presumably willing to handle the Burlington Northern Santa Fe originated PRB coal uh, that, that is needed to keep this plant in full operation. Secondly, the uh, MNA, uh, as the arrangement has it now, does not provide any limitation on the destination rent, if you will, for the PRB movements of coal to independence that formerly would have been provided by the possibility of an efficient interchange between the Burlington Northern and the Missouri Pacific uh, via Hoxie, Arkansas. Uh, this, there again, this, uh, this possibility does not exist with the MNA, uh, notwithstanding that uh, Burlington Northern route to the independence plant via this Hoxie interchange would be shorter than the route normally utilized by Union Pacific for the PRB coal moving to this plant. Uh, also, the paper barriers restrict or eliminate the MNA's ability to provide uh, non-PRB coals from numerous points that uh, would or could have been online origins for the Missouri Pacific, including some mines in Illinois, Kansas, Missouri, Texas, and Louisiana. Similarly, the, M the MNA is generally unable to <coughs> receive non-PRB coals and airline movements that the Missouri Pacific uh, could have handled from Kansas City Southern, Illinois Central, and part of the CN line, and even some of the Eastern Railroads. In the case of uh, KCS, this results from the paper barriers. And some of the uh, related to some of the other carriers, the MNA does not have the physical ability to interchange directly with them. UP has argued that these competitive options were lost uh, prior to the creation of the MNA, and thus were not caused by the paper barriers. Even if UP is correct in this point, AECC does not believe the board should view that as a satisfactory closure of the issue. AECC has been able to, unable to locate any board, ICC, or other authoritative decision that approved these losses of transportation that the independence plant uh, is experiencing. AECC has carefully reviewed the ICC decision that approved the WPMP UP merger. Holding aside the situations where remedial conditions were imposed, the ICC's approval was premised on a belief that, uh, and I quote, the proposed transactions present no other significant competitive problems in any transportation markets, including coal transportation markets. If a carrier's post-merger ability to transport traffic results from the exercise of market power, rather than improved service, the ICC specifically recognized in the UP MPWP decision that the possibility that this may result in efficiency, in inefficiency, the inability to achieve monopoly profits, reduce competition, and harm to essential services. The ICC did consider the public interest aspects of potential diversions to UP of, of being originated uh, PRB traffic terminated by the Missouri Pacific. Although BN may lose some or even all of the traffic it now handle, handles in joint line service with Missouri Pacific, this is not a public interest concern, <coughs> and there again this is a quote from ICC, unless the traffic diversion would have a detrimental impact on the users of the transportation services. 
In reviewing UP's filings, we don't see any evidence to refute the proposition that MNA no longer offers transportation options that would have been offered by an independent Missouri Pacific. Moreover, AECC and Entergy have certainly demonstrated the detrimental impacts resulting from the loss of these options. The question remains unanswered is how could these effects have occurred without ICC or board approval? Uh, testimony sponsored by ECC and Ex Parte 658, which was the Staggers Act review last year, highlighted how methodological refinements during the wave of rail mergers created better recognition of several types of competitive problems, including gateway closures, source competition, and some so-called crossover effects, entailing interactions among different transactions. This testimony also explained how some such problems inadvertently may have been overlooked in the earlier merger cases. We see elements of each of these issues at the independence plan. Closure of the Hoxie Gateway, a restricted ability to source substitute coal, and crossover effects between the UP-MPWP merger and the PRP, PRB joint line and connector line cases. Even if the problems we now have at the independence plan weren't created by the paper barriers, they are reinforced and maintained by the barriers, which limit the ability of an ostensibly independent railroad to provide service under its statutory obligations. Uh, certainly one, one way of uh, approaching this from our standpoint would be to, uh, to pursue the reopening of the WP, uh, UP MP merger case to try to permanently restore the lost competition uh, we believe the board has the authority to do that and, uh, and certainly could. Uh, however, we hope that the board uh, uh, here, herein gives consideration and weight to the fact that we have lived under these competitive restraints imposed by paper barriers for 14 years and, uh, and we would certainly endorse any action the board might take regarding paper barriers that would store, restore us to at least a portion of the rail options that we believe we should have had all along. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Brown. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Buttrey, Vice Chairman uh, uh, Mulvey. My name is Sandy Brown. I'm an attorney with the firm Troutman Sanders. I'm here today representing Ameren Energy Fuels and Services Company, um, which I'll refer to as Ameren. On behalf of Ameren, I'd like to thank you, the board, for hold, taking comments and holding a <coughs> hearing on paper barriers. In response to the board's February 1, 2006 decision, Ameren filed comments in this docket on March 8, 2006. Ameren is testifying today in response to the board's June 2nd decision to conduct a public hearing on paper barriers. I had intended to provide some background on Ameren and describe a paper barrier impacting Ameren's lavity plant, but in the interest of time, I will skip that portion and refer the board and others to Ameren's written comments. However, I do think it is important to note that the paper barrier impacting the Lavity Plant, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is a perfect example of an unreasonable paper barrier. It contains an outright and permanent restriction against coal traffic being moved to Lavity, which is contained in a line sale agreement that was designed to sell off a parallel line that was headed for abandonment. In other words, the selling railroad had no use for the line, so the paper barrier was only imposed to protect monopolistic access to the plant. Um, I will provide, I will next focus on the board's clear authority to regulate paper barriers and provide suggestions to address the anti-competitive nature of paper barriers. The board has and should exercise authority over anti-competitive behavior engaged in by railroads, particularly over the formation of unreasonable paper barriers. This authority is based upon and supported by one, the board's inherent statutory authority to the board's authority to assure railroads fulfill their common carrier obligation. Three, regulatory powers afforded federal agencies by Congress in analogous situations. And four, as addressed in recent board decisions. The board has exclusive jurisdiction over rail transportation under 49 USC 10501. Paper barriers are usually established in transactions that are quote, approved pursuant to the board's exemption authority under section 10502. The board has continuing jurisdiction under the statute to revoke an exemption quote, to the extent necessary to carry out the rail transportation policy or the RTP. The use of the exemption process 
to implement transactions with paper barriers gives the board authority to review at any time the past, present, and future transactions with an eye to carrying out the RTP and eliminating unreasonable paper barriers. The primary reason that certain paper barriers are unreasonable and conflict with the RTP is that they are specifically designed to prohibit or stifle competition. It is undisputed that our national public policy strongly favors competition in rail industry as elsewhere. This is captured in the heavy emphasis placed on competition in the RTP enacted by Congress in 49 U.S.C. Section 10101. Indeed, one-third of the points that Congress has mandated and codified in the RTP specifically charge the STB to promote and protect rail competition. The Board has recognized this authority to promote competition in rail construction cases and in, the, in rail construction cases and the revised rules for rail mergers. And this concept should be applied in line sales or other transactions that are currently used to create paper barriers. As the Board is probably aware, Ameren has been active in trying to improve rail service and rates at its plants by creating competitive transportation alternatives by method, methods such as rail construction. The Board encouraged shippers to invest in rail construction to promote competition. Ameren has shown that it is willing to do its part in investing in and expanding competition at its plants. Thus, Ameren is asking for a level playing field so that the promotion of competition is applied in all transactions before the Board. The Board should also look at whether paper barrier restrictions interfere with and therefore violate the common carrier obligation of railroads. If a rail line transaction includes a provision that prohibits the purchasing railroad from providing service to a shipper or shippers along its line, then the paper barrier should be deemed an unreasonable contract restriction to the acquiring railroad's common carrier <coughs> obligation. As in other instances, the Board should not approve agreements that require a railroad to contract away its common carrier obligations. The Board's mandate to promote competition under the RTP is similar to the authority over competition problems exercised by other agencies. In general, Congress has charged agencies with promoting competition and giving them the means to carry out that mandate. The STB should exercise its authority over competition issues within its jurisdiction, such as line, and lease, line sales and lease transactions, and follow the general policy that competition is not only desirable, it is imperative in the rail industry. It is instructive to look at the approach taken under the antitrust laws for evaluating whether a competition restricting condition similar to a paper barrier is a reasonable or unreasonable restraint on competition. Federal antitrust laws will permit, for example, covenants not to compete so long as they are limited in geographic scope and time. The antitrust case law approach is an effective method to ensure each transaction receives the proper scrutiny and thereby prevent the party's abilities to privately contract around <coughs> forbidden restrictions on competition. Similarly, the RTP weighs in favor of agreements that do not interfere with competition. Unreasonable paper barriers designed to permanently deter or prohibit a short-line railroad from interchanging traffic with the seller's competitors or from carrying certain traffic on its line serve neither the efficiency nor the public interest goals of the RTP and the Board's governing statutes. In sum, comparable competition analysis is performed by other agencies regarding the potentially anti-competitive effects of agreements would be rightfully exercised by the Board in evaluating paper barrier effects. The Board's ongoing authority under the exemption authority in Section 10502 should rightfully be exercised to ensure that competition is fostered by allowing the paper barrier by evaluating the impact on competition that could result from allowing the paper barrier term, excuse me, terms to remain in the agreement. The Board can and should exercise its authority to protect and promote competition. The anti-competitive nature of paper barriers has been recognized by one Board member in recent decisions. As Commissioner Mulvey noted, as Vice Chairman Mulvey noted, that paper barriers have little or no competitive value in rail, agree, rail line agreements. These concerns, as well as the appropriateness of time limitation for any restriction, were reflected in other decisions that address paper barriers. These statements appropriately reflect the Board's duty to promote the public interest, which is governed by the RTP. Ammon concurs that the Board has a duty to evaluate paper barriers in transactions with an eye towards opening up, not shutting down rail carrier competition to shippers. Ameren respectfully submits that the Board can and should use its authority to review alleged anti-competitive effects of paper barriers. If needed, Ameren encourages the Board to initiate a rulemaking to establish guidelines for challenging paper barriers. Some suggested remedies or guidelines to consider for addressing the anti-competitive aspects of paper barriers are as follows. First, the Board should establish a presumption for a sunset provision 
for all current paper barriers, limiting their life to no more than five years, unless the railroad that created the paper barrier shows that a longer or unlimited restriction is reasonable. Second, the board should develop guidelines to conduct a case-by-case -case review of current paper barriers for determining whether a paper barrier should be revoked or dissolved before the sunset period. Finally, the board should establish policies to ensure that reasonable paper barriers are not, unreasonable paper barriers are not permitted in future rail line sales or leases. I would like to take a few moments to address some of the questions raised, including antitrust immunity <coughs> and retroactivity. First, whether or not these transactions enjoy antitrust immunity should not be used to cloud the importance of the issue. The board has authority to take action on paper barriers and it should do so. Second, I'm not aware of any rule as defined by the Administrative Procedure Act that authorizes paper barriers. Thus, retroactive rulemaking arguments do not apply. Even assuming those rules did apply, the board can take reasonable retroactive action. Implementation of the relief requested in this proceeding would not impose damages for past actions and seeks only relief with respect to future rights of the parties. In other words, would be reasonable. Thank you for allowing Amron to share his views today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is, uh, good afternoon, my name is Jeff, Jeff Baker, and I have global purchasing responsibility for Dow Chemical Real Assets and Freight. Um, my purpose today is to provide you with insight into Dow Chemical's paper barrier situation and related commercial issues pertaining to Dow's facility in Ludington, Michigan. To my right is Mike Monroe. He's a member of Dow's legal department, and he'll address legal issues as it relates to paper barriers. Uh, Dow is a diversified chemical company that offers a broad range of chemicals, plastics, agricultural products to customers in more than 175 countries. Dow has approximately 20 billion of annual sales in North America, and we initiate in North America 130,000 rail shipments each year using a fleet of 28,000 rail cars. Dow's sole manufacturing facility for calcium chloride is located in Lyington, Michigan, and is served by a short line railroad called the Marquette Railroad. Calcium chloride is sold globally um, as uh, de-icing chemicals uh, for walkways, uh, oil and drilling fluids, and in uh, dust control. These markets are extremely price competitive with numer numerous product substitutes. Rail freight represents 30 to 50 percent of the total delivered calcium chloride product cost and is a major factor in determining the product's global competitiveness. The Marquette Railroad purchased an estimated 100 miles of rail line from Dow's Ludington facility to just north of uh, Grand, Grand Rapids, Michigan from the CSXT Railroad. Dow asked to be considered as a purchaser of this rail line, the line running from Ludington to, to, to north of Grand Rapids. However, CSXT would not allow Dow to participate in this bidding process. Marquette has indicated to Dow that a paper barrier and a steel barrier was imposed by CSXT as a part of the sale agreement. Dow's buyer estimates that, that the CSXT paper barrier more than doubles the Marquette portion of the rail rate from our Ludington facilities if Dow traffic wanted to connect to the NS. Uh, in Grand Rapids. So we have the ability to connect from Wellington to the Grand Rap into the NS in Grand Rapids. In addition, CSXT created a steel barrier which prevents Marquette from making a direct interchange with the NS or Norfolk Southern without first connecting to the CSXT line. This steel barrier allows CSXT to add additional rates along with paper barrier cost, you know, the uh, paper barrier cost to prevent a cost effective connection to the NS. The CSXT paper barrier and, and the steel barriers make it anti-competitive for Marquette to connect to the Norfolk Southern in Grand Rapids. Um, CSXT has used this lack of competition to increase our rates and now stress significantly increase our rates, which has been compounded through unjustified and unreasonable fuel surcharges. There's no economic justification to support the significant <coughs> CSXT rate increases other than the absence of effective rail competition. You know, we actually believe CSXT has improved the cost position by selling the Ludington line to Marquette Railroad and, and Dow wants viable railroads. What Dow does not want is to be subject to a monopoly situation, you know, created through artificial means such as paper and steel barriers to limit effective rail competition. 
And I'll stress, we've worked, you know, we've attempted to work with the CSX management to help them understand that we compete in a global calcium chloride market with, a, with primary competition from Europe and China. Now, imports are a significant threat to our calcium chloride franch franchise, and no one, neither Dow or CSXT, benefits if Dow loses market share. Since 2000, calcium chloride imports from China have grown from zero to 34 percent of the total U.S. calcium chloride import market. 10 percent of Dow's calcium chloride volume is exported from the United States through rail shipments to the Gulf ports. Uh, we compete, you know, globally with the Chinese and European producers who have substantial and growing excess capacity for calcium chloride. Dow has specifically asked CSXT for competitive rates to the Gulf with no success. You know, the lack of effective rail competition has further impacted our ability to compete in this global marketplace. 20% of Dow's calcium chloride shipments from Wellington terminate at NS destinations. Uh, we already, you know, with already constrained rail capacity, it makes no sense to allow anti-competitive barriers to add a third carrier to the route, in this case CSXT, which only serves to further increase cost, times, and potential accident risk. Dow has evaluated the railroad industry agreement referred to as the RIA relating to paper barriers with legal counsel and found the impact and the flexibility of the RIA to be difficult to interpret. The scope of the RIA seems to be limited to new business with a requirement to demonstrate how new routes will not harm the incumbent Class I railroad. Dow does not consider the current RIA to be an effective tool in addressing the need for enhanced rail competition. I will now turn it over to, to my right to, for the second part of Dow's testimony to Mike Monroe. He's Dow's Corporate Supply Chain International Trade Council. Thank you, Jeff. To Dow, the legal and conceptual argument is simple. Paper barriers are specifically intended to prohibit or stifle competition without any reasonable time limitation. That should just not be allowed. Only in rare cases, when there are highly compelling arguments, is anti-competitive behavior allowed under our laws, and that anti-competitive behavior is typically limited in time and scope. In addition, we believe the railroads must always bear the burden of proof why a particular strain of trade is necessary. We've seen arguments that suggest that paper barriers should be allowed because shippers such as Dow are no worse off than if the railroad would have decided not to sell to a third party. From a legal sense, this logic is flawed. The railroads are making the decision to bring in a third party, and we assume this decision is based on numerous factors, including strategic direction not to keep lower volume lines, higher operating costs of short runs, and cost of maintaining track. A whole host of monetary and non-monetary reasons. <coughs> the bottom line is that the railroad determines to bring in a third party. And under our laws, with that determination, comes an obligation not to engage in anti-competitive behavior with that third party. This board has stated objectives of encouraging competition. This is one area in which that can be accomplished. The board, of course, can and should consider long-standing jurisprudence on allowable short-term restraints, such as time-limited non-competition agreements. What should the board do in this instance? As referenced earlier, we believe the, the board has clear jurisdiction and could issue rulemaking. The board can determine in what circumstances anti-competitive behavior should be allowed and the scope and time frame of those agreements. In addition, as the board does in rate cases, financial formulas could be developed to ensure that railroads are fairly compensated for their rail lines. In determining fair compensation, however, numerous factors must be taken into consideration, including estimated cost savings and other factors that the railroads would likely use in their own determination whether or not to sell a short line. As any prudent business would, the railroads certainly document why they are considering, considering a divestiture. Those documents should be made available to the board. As stated, the railroads should bear the burden to demonstrate why their anti-competitive restraint of trade agreements are necessary. We believe the elimination or restriction of paper barriers 
is a real step forward in bringing railroads in line with basic legal principles which govern the vast majority of our U.S. economy. We understand that historically railroads have had difficulty in becoming economically viable, but expect everyone here would agree that today railroads are much more profitable than they were just a few years ago. Things have changed. Dow has a great respect for the railroads. We value our relationship with our key carriers, such as the Union Pacific. In all our customer and supplier relationships, we fully comply with the law and abide by high ethical standards. What we are supporting here is in line with those principles. We trust that the board will carefully examine the facts, the issues, the principles of law, and we hope will make the determination that paper barriers as currently used should be restricted or eliminated altogether through rulemaking or otherwise. Thank you again for your time. If it pleases the board, my name is Jeff Herndon. I am manager of coal supply for Entergy Services, Inc., a subsidiary of Entergy Corporation. Entergy is a co-owner and the operator of Independent Station, which my colleague down at the end of the table has indicated is in northeast corner of Arkansas, located on an M&A Missouri uh, Northern Arkansas Railroad sublease or lease. The original coal that was delivered to the independent station was delivered under a tariff movement with the BN originating the coal, interchanging at Kansas City with the Missouri Pacific Railroad and delivering along this very line to the uh, independence plant. It wasn't until the merger of the Union Pacific Railroad and the Missouri Pacific Railroad and Western Properties did UP take over the, the delivery <coughs> of coal to Independence Station. A number of years after this merger, the UP elected to uh, lease this line uh, that the uh, station is on and place a number of paper barriers that uh, affect our ability to operate the, the plant. Even though the Missouri Pacific Railroad, uh, the Northern, Missouri and Northern Arkansas Railroad has direct interconnect with the BNSF and the Can Kansas City Railroads, the Missouri, <coughs> the Missouri and Northern Arkansas Railroad is prevented from making deliveries from coal originated by these carriers without uh, incurring some very healthy economic disincentives. These disincentives appear in the forms of paper barriers in the lease agreement between the Missouri and Northern Arkansas and the Union Pacific Railroad. This lease is a public document. It is being submitted as part of my written testimony and it is on the board's website for review. Uh, the first of the paper barriers that is found in this lease can be found in section 4.03 wherein the annual lease payment of $90 million is reduced inversely with the percentage of car loadings interchanged with the UP. For example, at 95% car loadings of the UP in any one total year, there is no payment for rent. However, if one car load more than 5% is interchanged with any railroad other than the UP, then there is an occurring a $10 million lease payment. This $10 million lease payment will be added for each 10% drop in the car loading percentages from 95% until you get down to a 4% total traffic interchange wherein the lease payment would be the entire $90 million cost. These values are in 1992 dollars. There are escalating values to these dollars. So the values certainly today are a lot bigger than what I'm discussing. In UP's own testimony, they suggested that a short, learn, short line uh, per lease or purchase of a line such the size of the Missouri Northern Arkansas should generate 5% or 5,000 cars that could be interchanged without causing any kind of economic incentive. If you apply the 5% ratio to that, that would indicate that that 
results in 100,000 car loadings per year that is suggested by the uh, Union Pacific that is the size of the, the business that the Missouri and Northern Arkansas Railroad is doing. If we look at the independence business by itself, we would represent more than 50% of the car loadings that is being shared to the uh, Missouri, Missouri, to the Union Pacific Railroad. And in fact, if you take one train a week of delivery against the seven and a half trains a week of delivery of coal that is needed at the independence plant to operate, it would more than consume all available car loading free interchange that the Missouri and Northern Arkansas would have. You would think that would be an effective barrier to, to keep competition from happening and, and prevent uh, the shoreline railroad from uh, doing other service. But the UP apparently didn't think so, and they applied another uh, paper barrier <coughs> on this thing against a single customer of the line. That's found in Section 3.04 of the lease, where the UP can, by giving a seven-day notice, retain or re get back the deliveries of the independent station. And once they take back the delivery, then the independent station would be a close uh, industry to the Union Pacific, and the Missouri and Northern uh, Arkansas Railroad could not deliver any traffic to it, even though it resides on their own line. This provision only perpetuates the captive shipper constraints imposed by paper barriers. As we heard today, UP wants to make the argument that once captured, always captured. I'm not a lawyer, but it is my understanding that when other industries sell off other assets, there cannot be any unreasonable constraint placed on those assets to be used by the, the purchasing party. Why should the railroad be any different? I would submit even that limiting access to generating facilities that have alternate rail deliveries is against the interest of national security during times when we have uh, rail disruption abilities and can't get coal there. Twice we've had paper barriers specifically uh, prevent uh, ISIS from getting coal to the plant that was kept from being happening by the, these paper barriers. The first time happened in 1997 during the uh, Union Pacific and SP merger meltdown when the uh, UP prevented BN from servicing the plant to help out the deliveries. The second is still ongoing is from the, 19, the 2005 track problems that happened in the Powder River Basin and that prevented us from getting alternative coal being delivered to Independence uh, Station through KCS um, uh, originations. Paper bears have the potential to be a serious threat to the reliability of electric grid in Arkansas and elsewhere that they exist when they prevent energy and other utilities from being able to deliver a service field during service disruptions of the railroads. We must not lose track of the fact that they also have an economic impact uh, uh, as a result of being in place. The use of paper barriers allows the railroad, the class one railroads to maintain control over deliveries and thereby enabling higher charges for services rendered. However, at the present time, Entergy is less concerned with the in, uh, economic impact uh, as opposed to reliability issues because we do, in fact, have a long-term contract that has several years left to go. But when this contract does expire, it does place the customers of independence at exposures that it cannot receive the benefits of competitive coal <coughs> services from ISIS because of these paper barriers would be in place. And in fact, these, peri these barriers do present a problem for future circumstances that might arise later on. For example, the Dakota, Minnesota, and Eastern Railroad could have interconnections with the Kansas City uh, Southern Railroad and deliver coal to the Independence Power Plant that would be prevented 
if these paper barriers are still in place. I appreciate the board for taking the time to take up these paper barrier issues in these proceedings, and I urge the board to take the next step and institute a full-fledged rulemaking procedure to consider the standards and procedures for review and evaluation of paper barriers in the interchange. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks uh, for the comments of all the witnesses uh, on this panel. Uh, it seems to be the suggestion in general, uh, on this panel anyway, that that should the board decide to uh, uh, get involved in this in a more uh, strident way, that uh, there's sort of a mixture of approaches. That is, some issues could be handled on a blanket basis, and then maybe some issues could be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. Does anybody have any comments on uh, on that? I'll take a stab at it first, and I think I would want to say, I would say that I think the board ought to take a reasonable approach to looking at paper barriers, whatever the method is. Uh, and if case by case is applicable to certain ones and a blanket is others, then that's a, certainly a good step forward. Uh, Doug, I would support just the general threshold of, of some reasonable time period. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, you know, we do not have a problem with you know, the railroads making a profit and doing well. We want them to do that. So uh, a blanket, you know, mm -hmm. threshold period of time would, would be added <coughs> to for us. And then closer review for future paper barriers would you know, be something that we would hope for. Mm -hmm. There's uh, seems to be a, a fair amount of anecdotal, what could be reviewed as anecdotal information that's been uh, <coughs> taken here in testimony today. Uh, some would say basically the issue is an anecdotal issue, that there are some peculiar situations out there that have evolved over the years that, that uh, may not be quite uh, to some people's liking, and, but that, uh, that a lot of the paper barriers that are out there really do not have any significant harmful effects, and the board should basically leave those in place. Uh, the information that we've gotten, uh, especially from uh, Amerid, Amerid this energy this morning, uh, sounds like one of those cases there where there's some pretty serious issues on an anecdotal basis anyway. Well, the, and I didn't go into this, and I, and I can go into it more, but the, the, the paper barrier that impacts Ameren is actually um, a short line railroad now owned by Ameren. Um, but the, the line was a parallel line that, um, that Union Pacific has a lot, two, had two lines as a result of the UPSP merger that came from Kansas City to St. Louis. Um, the line that was sold off, the second line, um, the Union Pacific didn't, doesn't need and didn't need to serve the plant. So it seems to me that it's a perfect example of a paper barrier um, where the line is sold and, and the existing carrier, Union Pacific, doesn't need the line to serve the plant. Um, and the paper barrier put in place um, seems to be solely to keep that without even getting into some of the history as to the dates when the line was sold. Um, it wasn't clear whether or not Ameren was going to retain its two to one status. Um, Ameren had to file a petition for clarification in order to receive that um, after the line was already sold off. So um, it seems to be even a clearer case where the paper barrier was put in to try to protect whatever monopolistic. Um, um, uh, you know, uh, access might have been there. Sure. Um, <coughs> on the question of the ability, um, when you had a case where you had a, a shortage of, of, of coal and stockpiles of coal and you were unable to get deliveries by another carrier because of the uh, paper barrier that there was a sort of an emergency, wouldn't the board's emergency uh, service orders be appropriate to, uh, to make sure that the coal is delivered and wouldn't that override a paper barrier if the, if the board was issues this in order in, in that kind of a case? I'm not totally familiar with uh, the absolute requirements of the emergency procedures. Uh, I do not believe that without having some reasonable term of service it's going to be very difficult to get another carrier to provide coal into a into a location that they were not currently serving and didn't have the facilities uh, set up to do so. Um, so uh, I, I, 
I'll have to refer to my lawyers to to respond to that question in more detail than that. Um, Ms. Brown, you suggest that um, we should search the paper barriers after a duration of about five years. And um, how did you arrive at that at the five-year time period? And what about future paper barriers? Would you uh, have us limit them to no more than five years or prohibit them outright? Um, well, on the five-year provision, um, looking at other examples of out there, five years seems to be reasonable. Um, and so that's how the five years was, was selected. Um, as far as outright prohibiting them in the future, I think that there should be a presumption that they are not um, permitted unless you can show that they there is a reasonable um, um, reasonableness attached to the paper barrier with maybe a limited time or scope, um, but that the presumption should be that paper barriers should not be permitted in the future. Um, Mr. Sharp, in your written comments, you claim that the uh, premium you pay for moving coal to the independence plant uh, because of the paper barrier is increased by at least $3.25 a ton. Uh, how did you calculate that figures and what were the factors that went into that calculation? Um, and do you, how do you know if these factors are attributed to the paper barrier and not to the fact that independence, the independence plan is, is largely captive? Were you referring to me, Steve? Yeah, sure. yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, that that uh, those numbers were developed through by by a consultant to us. Uh, Is that study available? Yes, we we can provide that. We'd like to see that because, okay. as, as I said earlier, there's a real lack of uh, of hard evidence as to what these paper barriers actually affect. As the chairman just mentioned, maybe some of these are. are uh, don't have much of an effect, especially in today's environment. But uh, when we have hard evidence as to what the impacts are, that, that helps us in our deliberations. Yeah, we'll be happy to provide that. Uh, Dow Chemical, how close is uh, <coughs> the NS connection to the short line that serves you? Uh, less than uh, half a mile. Okay. So less than 18 miles then. Yeah. See, if you were a little further up on the other border, uh, you would be in the 18 mile. Uh, territory with uh, where Canada would require allow you to require reciprocal switching, correct? Correct. Yeah, we, we have plants in Canada that understand the reciprocal switch, and we find that to be very favorable. Do you uh, are you able to do a comparison between your rates in Canada and your rates down here, and um, tease out the paper barrier effect? Well, the, you know, first of all, the paper barrier is basically confidential between the two, the short line and the, and the class <laughs> one railroad. But mm -hmm. I mean, you know, based on our estimate of captivity. You know, that's how we've drawn our conclusion. We've had captive plants where we basically built into those facilities, and we've found that we pay premiums for somewhere between, you know, 20 to 25 percent. 20 25 percent? Uh, of a captivity premium. But on top of that, captivity premium is a paper barrier that we estimate doubles the rate of the short line running down from Ludington down to Grand Rapids. So you have this paper barrier impact on top of that. And then also to be clear, the short, short line cannot connect to the <coughs> NS without going through another steel barrier. So there's another cost there that's been imposed because it's not a direct connection that the short line to Grand Rapids. Maybe you should get the chemical business included in the Canadian Grain Board's regulation. <laughs> that might help. Uh, couldn't resist them, so. <laughs> if a shipper such as Hammerin could participate in the rail industry working group, what form would you envision Hammerin or uh, shippers participating in the um, RIWG? Well, I guess Hammerin could participate through its Missouri Central Railroad subsidiary um, in the rail industry, but Hammerin's an existing shipper on the line, so there's no relief to even get under the railroad industry agreement. Um, with respect to the paper barrier at the Lavity plant. Um, I don't envision that the railroad industry group would be the answer to this um, issue. Um, I, having an agreement that's developed between the parties who make these agreements, I don't view that as the answer. I, I would want the board to um, um, take the issue and, and make its rulings. So you don't think you could help liberalize some of these agreements uh, by participating in the in the group, or that's not, that would not be an option in formulating, say, a new rail industry agreement that was somewhat more liberal and uh, permitted more waivers of these uh, paper barriers? 
Um, I haven't seen any other evidence of that to, to date. And again, I would um, respectfully request that the board take that action. Um, this issue has gone on for a very long time. Um, and I think a, a, a decision and a result does need to be um, undertaken sooner rather than later. Uh, just one more observation. You mentioned about DNA <coughs> not being able to uh, serve you through its connection with the KCS because of the paper barrier. I just sort of wonder if that's a problem that DNA is going to have in other uh, operations. Uh, does it have a lot of paper barriers that would have to get, get over in order to uh, be a competitor? It's an interesting observation. I hadn't heard that before. Yeah, I can't make a comment on how many others they may have that might prevent them from uh, service. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a fourth panel. <coughs> Columbus and Greenville Railroad Company, Genesee and Wyoming, Oil Creek and Titusville Lines, Watco and Wheeling and Lake Erie. Does everybody have a name, name plate? They didn't give me a name plate. <laughs> My name is Roger Bell. Yeah. Your badge is mission, missing. Yeah, I'm out of order altogether. <laughs> How did you get in here? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> but I'm here. Uh, Mr. Marshall's name badge is missing. Oh, there it is. Okay. It's supposed to be visible, Mr. Marshall. Uh, you might want to put it on the outside of your jacket there, yeah. We're going to get real sticky about this. <clears throat> we already are real sticky about it. Ticky, not sticky, ticky. Anyway, thank you very much for coming, and we are looking forward to, uh, to your very enlightening testimony. Thank you. Mr. Bell. Thank you, Chairman Buttrey and Honorable Member Vice Chairman uh, Mulvey. Well, thank you for the opportunity to address the board regarding the issue of paper barriers on small railroads. I serve as president of CAGY Industries and the three short-line railroads that we own and operate in the states of Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. We have uh, about 35 employees and we operate a total of about 150 miles of railroad. We have both ISS and handling line carrier agreements. We have direct connections with four class ones and we've been operating short-line railroads for more than 30 years. Based on these experiences, I would be opposed to the adoption of rules placing new restrictions or requirements on the lease or sale of uh, future short-line rail operations regarding the issue of paper barriers. The short-line industry has experienced phenomenal growth and development of new operations across the country during the past 20 years. The ex this expansion has been a positive alternative to the abandonment of many of these properties. Preservation of rail service has served most aspects of our industry well, including the shipping community, much of which is located in rural areas across the nation, off the interstate system, and in desperate need of retaining multiple modes of transportation to remain competitive, reliable employers, and productive corporate citizens to these local communities. The percentage of growth in carload traffic on short line railroads has outpaced the percentage of total carload growth in the industry for the past several years, so I believe we're doing a number of things right. There have been abandonments, and some operations have failed. But overall, thousands of miles of track has been saved, hundreds of businesses with thousands of employees retain quality rail service, and tens of millions of dollars has been invested in equipment and infrastructure in the short line community. Many of these properties were not candidates for operation in the traditional sense, 
due to low traffic levels that could not generate revenue sufficient to sustain reasonable operations if required to fund true value debt service. As an alternative to abandonment, many short lines were created through lease sale agreements that allowed the Class I an opportunity for a fair return on those assets while providing, providing the short line the time needed to develop new traffic. These unique agreements kept thousands of miles of rail line in service, thus avoiding abandonment and liquidation. Additionally, rail jobs were preserved and short line operators were afforded an opportunity to dedicate scarce resources towards improvement of operations, offering better service to customers and increased maintenance of track and infrastructure, assuring safer, dependable operations and an opportunity to develop traffic. The short line industry's record indicates significant levels of success in these categories. Restrictions or requirements imposed on the parties of these transactions would likely have impeded or possibly eliminated many of those operations before they started. While the past several years have produced historic results for the development of new short line operations, there is no perfect system and there have been some problems, but our industry has worked together to address them. Class 1s in the short line industry established a railway working industry group as a vehicle to address specific issues related to paper barriers as, as they arise, which has worked well. Short lines and the Class 1s communicate better now than ever before. Class 1s host their own annual short line conference with hundreds of short line participants, and most have caucus groups that meet on a regular basis to identify issues, communicate with their short lines, to inform and share new programs, operating plans, and technological advancements. Paper barrier issues should be addressed in the private sector and where possible resolved on a case-by-case -case basis. The key component to successful negotiations in addressing issues in our handling line agreements is the relationship between the short line operator and his or her class one partner. For short lines, these relationships are essential to our everyday operations and our customers depend on it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Parsons. <coughs> Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Vice Chairman, staff, it's my pleasure to be here today, and uh, I will not uh, regress to my statement, which you have, but uh, uh, you can read it. It's one page, and everything I do is short. We appreciate I, that. Okay, I, I'm sure you do. Uh, the, uh, the issue is simple. We, we operate about 850 miles of short line railroad. We have no restrictions, but we believe whatever the arrangements are when deals are done should prevail. So if a, uh, the economics uh, dictate a restriction, it should stay in place. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. My name is Ed McTechnic. I guess it is now. <laughs> We're moving right along, aren't we? Um, my name is Ed McKeck, and I'm Chief Commercial Officer for Watco Companies. Uh, I'm also in the Rail Industry Working Group, and we've got a quick PowerPoint presentation to walk through, but it's also been handed out to you, so we can just, I'll go through it for you. Uh, this technology is going to slow us down here for just a second. Mr. Chairman, I believe you've got a copy of it with you. The first, the first, the first slide um, shows our national network. We have about 3,000 miles of track. There we go. All this way you need to see me over here. Okay, Roger. Sure. There's our uh, network. We have about 3,000 miles of track. We connect with five of the seven North American Class One railroads. Those show all of our interchanges. So if you have questions about those in particular, you can go through there. Four quick points is that paper barriers are a key element of short line outsourcing as we work to consider these. We have to understand what the limitations are of the Class One to outsource something. And so when we approach a Class One about making it, creating a short line railroad, or they approach us, we understand that that is a key portion of protecting their franchise. We believe the STB should consider requiring the reporting of paper barriers in the initial exemption notice that creates a new rail carrier or allows additional track to be acquired. So that um, paper barriers are a key element of the short line outsourcing. A couple of points on that. 
but that lowers the cost of the acquisition. Uh, in many cases, it avoids the full going concern cost of a transaction. So in, in essence, we've looked at a, of a transaction here recently that would be about $20 million in revenue, and the capital just to get the thing up and going would be about $17 to $18 million on a lease. The additional cost of purchasing a railroad in addition to that would make that railroad unable to be uh, outsourced and would lead to potential abandonments. It does have the lower cost barriers for entry. One of the things we ought to consider about this when we started this, there were plenty of excess locomotives in the market 20 years ago, and you could pick up a locomotive for fifty or $100,000, uh, right, pull it right off the, the uh, siding and put it into service. Today, you're going to pay four hundred fifty dollars to $500,000 for a locomotive, and that's after three months of shop work. It avoids potential abandonments because the NLV is greater than the going concern value. Uh, paper barriers, one of the things that we really want you to think about is the creation of uh, networks that allow for additional capacity. Uh, paper barriers allow larger regional networks to be created. This allows short haul traffic to be developed. Uh, additional value for customers, additional values for communities, and it grows the short line industry, which we think is a good thing. <coughs> Just an example here of something to walk through to think through this. And I deal with this every day out there dealing with networks. So you have a sample network here. This is something that a class one might want to outsource. And they would put paper barriers in place to say, uh, to help to help control the, the traffic that goes off to protect that, that outsourcing. And this would be something that would be in the neighborhood of a $20 million uh, network, maybe a couple hundred miles. So if, if you didn't outsource this with paper barriers to, to, to be able to protect this franchise, you'd go through a series of abandonments that would lead you to a conclusion that would not be in the public interest. So after the first uh, abandonment, you would still have some interchange there on the on the left side of the network. You would have a, a small short line or a small uh, island operation out there um, that would not be connected to the rest of the network. Uh, later on, you would abandon the second part of the network uh, so that you would again have uh, care, uh, customers cut off from the rest of it. And finally, go through and abandon significant other portions of the line cutting up and chopping up the network. And this, while this is a hypothetical, it's based on, on, on facts of what we've experienced and also a real case study that we're working on as a potential outsourcing. And so what we would argue is, is that preserving that, that regional network has more public value to more customers than, than removing a paper barrier for a select few customers. And that in the board's decision, it needs to take into consideration the value for all customers versus a few. So this example shows a smaller network that is reduced over time, eliminating real opportunities for OFAs. Because in reality, what, the, what po folks will say is you can just do an OFA and preserve those chunks of track. But if there are no customers on that track, you can't make an OFA to preserve that. And it may take 20, what I just, what I just showed here on the board, could be over a 10 or 15 year period of time. And you can't, you can't expend those types of dollars uh, on a track on the IFCOM that someday you'll be able to put together a network. Most importantly, it does not offer value for short haul network. If you look at capacity on our interstate network, uh, interstate highway system, a lot of that short haul, a lot of that is short haul, and that's where railroads offer real opportunity. So finally, we suggest that the STB consider requiring the reporting of paper bearers in the initial exemption notice. Uh, this would be information that would be gathered to understand the value of the entire transaction. I think it warrants further study, and a specific STB adhering is warranted for this concept. Uh, in, in summary, the government let the market work. Paper barriers are an important part of our industry. Uh, they are evolving with the help of the rail industry working group. It's not perfect, but it gets better every time we meet. And I think most importantly, as you've heard from all the arguments today, good and accurate information is probably the most important thing that would help serve the board so that you had exactly you understood exactly what the paper barrier was and what it was doing with each transaction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Vice Chairman. <coughs> Mr. Marshall, you next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. <laughs> Vice Chairman. Uh, Genesee and Wyoming and Farm Rail together operate about 3,000 route miles of short lines across the country. Uh, some of those railroads are subject to paper barriers and some are not. Uh, uh, I'd like to talk just a little bit about uh, the bigger picture here. Uh, I looked at the traffic that uh, is subject to paper barriers on our systems, and it seems to be made up mostly of merchandise traffic, paper, lumber, metals, uh, 
things that are shipped by groups that haven't been represented at this hearing here today. I tried to consider what sort of characteristics this traffic had, and you'll see that it moves generally one car at a time, and when it gets out on the main line, it moves in mixed freight trains. The surprising thing about this merchandise traffic or loose car traffic is that it is, first of all, highly truck competitive, but also highly competitive against unit trains for truck space on the main line railroads. In other words, those of us who are in the loose car business, small shippers and small railroads, are being nibbled at one side by the trucks and on the other side by the unit train shippers who are trying to get that precious and scarce truck space on the main line railroads. The problem we face as merchandise shippers is that if we don't become competitive for that main line truck space, we will rightfully be squeezed out because a rational big railroad goes after the traffic which is most profitable. So regulation of paper barriers, as I see it, would hurt in three ways. It would hurt small shippers and railroads first by tending to lower prices on this competitive merchandise business that is already struggling to be able to renew the assets that are used to support it. Second, it would cause the large railroads to be very cautious and reluctant about creating new short lines. And short lines are, I believe, the key to the future of merchandise traffic because we provide the efficiency and the customer friendly service that is important for merchandise shippers. I like to think we do it better than the big railroads do it. But finally, and most immediately, and this is the thing that we are concerned about, is that if short line traffic, merchandise traffic, is made less attractive to the big railroads, if their margins go down because there is more competition, the winner for that scarce truck space is going to be unit trains. You'll see more coal trains and fewer box cars on the truck space that's there. And that will happen very quickly. You hear about railroads demarketing this or that. That's one symptom of this competition for main line truck space. So I think that all of us in this business together can make the merchandise business a better product for the railroads and a better product for our shippers if we work together on it. But regulation of the sort that has been proposed in this proceeding could inhibit that cooperation, could inhibit the profitability that's needed for investment, and could stop in its tracks the efforts to maintain the merchandise business. So I'm hoping that you will not start a rulemaking or go down that road. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Chairman Buttery, Mr. Vice Chairman Mulvey, I'm Robert Dingman, President of the Oil Creek and Titusville Alliance. We appreciate this opportunity to appear before the Board and to address the rail access and competition issues, which are the subject of this ex parte 575 proceeding and commonly referred to as paper barriers. First, we agree that paper barrier is a legitimate tool. It's a legitimate result of a bargaining process entered into between a selling or leasing carrier and a purchasing or tenant carrier when the selling or leasing carrier chooses to remove itself from the direct operation of a line segment or any portion of its service territory. If the selling or leasing carrier retains a franchise in the territory served by the line, and if it retains an investment in assets formerly used to provide the direct service, the paper barrier is no more than a form of deferred compensation in a structured transaction. The removal or modification of the paper barrier, which is used to finance the transaction by parties other than the parties to the bargaining process, would constitute confiscation of property without just compensation. So you can see by the first paragraph, Dingman is in line with the rest of his friends and associations in the railroad industry. However, I think to widen the discussion today is an important thing, and I'm glad Charlie has brought it up, because the original conveyance of a franchise to serve a territory for the public convenience and necessity 
carried with it the obligation to serve the public by creating value through time and place utility for the goods carried. The STB is clearly the agency charged with the obligation to provide regulatory oversight on behalf of the public to assure that the objectives and benefits of the franchise accrue to all parties, but especially to the public. And in this regard, I have to believe that regulation is required when an industry is a public utility. We can deregulate certain aspects, and I have written since the Smathers Act in support of deregulation. But there comes a time when a public utility owes an obligation in the franchise. The public has voiced its continued support for our national rail system that is healthy, efficient, and serves all the lanes of commerce in an equitable fashion. And I emphasize all the lanes of commerce. Generally, the public, through the STB, has continued the franchise rights while permitting the seller or leasing carrier and the purchasing or tenant carrier to arrive at a service configuration which reduces cost to the divesting carrier. That's why they did it. We believe that the shipping public has been reasonably well served by the NERSA process and other post-Staggers Act legislation, which required the opportunity to continue low-density rail lines in service rather than to complete an abandonment process because the infrastructure was to be preserved. This legislation required the divesting carriers to make reasoned effort to secure transactions which permitted a purchaser or lessee to obtain certification from the STB and to obtain connection, interchange, and service from the divesting carrier. The purchaser or lessee should not be required to purchase or lease a divested property with no guarantees of service <coughs> quality, that's timeliness, and no right to participate in the marketing of the service, principally rate making. The public has frequently expressed its support by investing in the purchase, rehabilitation, or operation of the acquired property. In other words, the public has spoken loudly in what its interest is. The oversight of the STB should be no less than a learned review of the transaction between the parties to insist that reasonable standards of service and equity of rate making are contained within the transaction and enforced over the life of the transaction. I'll abbreviate. Standards of service are part of the means and methods by which railroad companies create the time utility which is demanded by the shipping public. Service that is so deficient that it dries up or discourages traffic is tantamount to de facto abandonment, and public policy says no. Premium pricing, which may be justified by improved system metrics, is designed to improve yield and finance additional mainline capacity. But premium pricing is inappropriate to the customer served by lanes <coughs> where deficient service is the only <coughs> service offered to the connecting carriers. In summary, an active effort by the STB is required to develop the performance standards which all parties must adhere to for the benefit of the public interest. The economic circumstances of the small carriers and the regions they serve are disproportionate when compared to the vast resources of the Class 1s. Only the STB can effectively address these issues and embody the objectives of the Interstate Commerce Clause of the United States. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, mention has been made of uh, the board considering reporting requirements when these transactions come before the board. Uh, I was curious about reporting requirements. Are you just talking about notice? Or are we talking about full public disclosure here? We're open to whatever you think meets your needs. I mean, I think, I think information has a process that needs to be thought through of, of what is exactly is it that ought to be out there and discussed so that it's more factual. Uh, you know, have to kind of talk through that and you'll be comfortable with those concepts. But I think ultimately you know, we're better off discussing facts and everybody's saying, I don't like paper bears. Well, I've never seen one, but I know it's there. I know it's bad. I don't think that's helpful for anybody. So if we all knew what we were talking about, we'd probably get to a conclusion faster. I was just curious, Mr. Parsons, how is it that you were able to escape uh, uh, the paper barriers in your uh, transactions? Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> so it wasn't negotiating expertise or clairvoyance no. or anything like that? No. <laughs> okay. That's the only question I had. Thank you. Um, 
First, I want to say that I've uh, <coughs> been a long time supporter of the uh, short line industry, and as many of you know, I worked very hard to get the financing for the rehabilitation of the short lines um, when I was on the Hill. So I continue to be a strong supporter of the short lines, and I want to see them. We want to see them prosper. Um, but I am, but I do have some problems with uh, with the issue today. Payment barriers represent really a restriction on your business activities. I mean, the things you can't do. And I can't think of any other any times when having less uh, scope of authority, having less opportunities, and having restrictions placed on you make you better off. Uh, wouldn't you all agree, set of parity, uh, other things being equal, that uh, you'd be better off without the paper barriers, assuming that you would have been created, better off without them than with them? Maybe in the short term. Uh, it's hard to go to the locally owned Burger King and buy a Big Mac. Uh, in the long term, uh, we need the Class 1 railroads to maintain a system of merchandise trains, classification yards, local service to get to and from the interchange points, and in addition, their own pickup and delivery service for the non short line merchandise customers. Uh, I see paper barriers, as unattractive as they may be in the short term, as maintaining the kind of margins for the large carriers that are needed to keep this very extensive service in place, which supports all of us. Well, you've expressed concern about the um, about paper barriers. Uh, if they were taken away, it could jeopardize the uh, some of the traffic, the merchandise traffic that the short lines carry. But what about the common carrier obligation that all short line rail, all railroads have to carry traffic, even less than unit train traffic? Because the common carrier obligation here, uh, the railroads, you, you would say the railroads could legitimately demarket all this traffic uh, absent, short, absent paper barriers? Most of the traffic is highly truck competitive. And by raising the prices, even though still below the regulatable level, uh, the railroads could inhibit the movement of this traffic uh, by rail. And I think quickly the merchandise traffic would dry up. Uh, it has happened in other countries, and it could happen here, and we'd see an all-unit train system develop. Um, someone mentioned paper barriers as a solution for the capacity problem uh, that helped to create more capacity. Um, with Mr. McBride, who spoke here earlier, said that eliminating paper barriers would create more capacity. Uh, I guess, is this, the, is this the proper approach to deal with the railroad capacity problem, either repealing or continuing paper barriers? I mean, uh, I'm not really sure the, uh, the, the capacity impact here. Mr. Vice Chairman, I think the creation of regional networks that have a focus on, on that short haul move that the class ones are capital restrained from participating in is better left in the hands of the short line who have different access to capital. Because in many ways, a lot of this is capacity constraints driven by capital. Our ability to go out and, and get capital and put in with a protected regional network that we have a lower cost of entry to getting into. So what I would say is that the, boards, the board ought to be encouraging the outsourcing of secondary and tertiary mains to short lines to be putting uh, additional capacity into service. And one of the ways to do that is to make sure that the paper barrier is in place, that the that the class one knows it's not going to have to take this back in some short notice, and that the board, not only through this but other ways, ought to be encouraging those outsourcing of lines that are way under capacity right now, but if it were put in the hands of a short line, could add one, two, three trains a day. There was this um, chart up here before showing what would happen as the rail network began to Slowly, slowly atrophy and will finally disappear, serving some shippers. But isn't logic, some holes of the logic here that paper barriers, um, uh, without them, that uh, these lines would never be created? Uh, if, the, if the line has enough value for the railroad want to retain it, uh, but it's, it's marginal and the railroad wants to get out of it, why wouldn't somebody uh, put out an OFA? And you would have an Office of Financial Assistance, you would have another railroad come in, or would that be uh, circumscribed by the, per by the paper barrier? What prevents that? Because the part of the line that would be abandoned wouldn't have any traffic on it, and so it would probably be more of a two-year exemption. But why so it, it chops it up from the rest of the network. But I was thinking the, the, when you're creating the paper barrier, there already is traffic there, 
and you're trying to preserve that traffic as a class one railroad and preserve those revenues. So there is traffic on that. So if I find that traffic marginal and I want to focus my resources elsewhere, and I want to get out from under this kind of traffic, which is still generating revenues, uh, why do I need to create a short line and a paper barrier when I could just as well sell it uh, as an OFA in terms of the public's interest on this? Uh, I'm not in a position. I don't know why they don't. I don't know why that doesn't happen. I just know it doesn't happen that way. And it should. We ought to, you know, understand what are paths to success. And the paper barrier and the creation of a regional network is a path to success. Where just letting it happen out there and picking up the scrap value of the steel has not led to creation of those regional networks. Yeah, I, I'm not suggesting that's what that would happen. Right. They would in fact create these other ones if paper barriers were somehow prohibited. Well, the paper barrier, I think, creates the economic incentive to do it. Without the paper barrier, it's not going to happen. It's and then the class simple. one railroad will continue to operate. The, the no, will probably abandon it. Well, then, then an OFA might come out. Huh? An OFA might be offered. Might. The, the, the difficulty there is that the class one would probably <coughs> raise the prices to dry up the line uh, before disposing of it. Uh, the To dispose of it... Uh, with low prices to a third party without commercial restraints would likely be the lowest uh, economic return. And once this process started happening, the class ones would quickly lose their enthusiasm completely for the loose car traffic, and uh, we'd get to the situation of the sort that Genesee and Wyoming has seen in Australia, where there is no loose car traffic, where everything moves in unit trains. My final question then is, what about the suggestion that while paper barriers, therefore, might be needed in order to get short lines created, they're not needed in perpetuity, that they should be at some point terminated when the, when the class one gets the value of the, the, the difference in value from uh, and having it and not having it in the transaction. That assumes that the evaluation is uh, somehow not understood, and I think it is. That's why you have the paper barrier. It's forever. Well, that would say that the value of it is infinite as well, and the value yeah. is forever. Yeah. If you look at the 100-plus year history of the railroad industry, traffic moves to and from different lines. And so in 1920, there was a set of lines that had 20 trains a day on it, triple track. Okay. Right now, you, you know, you've got more tumbleweeds in that line than you do trains. Another line that was completely empty 80 years ago is now completely full. Mm -hmm. And so you have to look at, I think you have to look at this in the very long-term nature of it and say that just because traffic is down there now, it may make sense to shortline that for 20 years to preserve that part of the national network. And in 20 years, maybe the class one takes it back, but both parties have been treated fairly and understand you know, the, the implications there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your testimony. This concludes the hearing and the matters before the board. Thank you.